Hi everybody, this is Damien from Legend Life. With our experience talks, we look to share with you tips, advice, and inspiration to get you outdoors and experiencing more. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Stephanie Mayo. Stephanie is in charge of marketing at the Sierra Clubs, Clubs uh, San Diego Branches uh, Wilderness Basics course. Um, Stephanie's been good enough to agree to give us the lowdown on how do you get started in hiking and backpacking. So Stephanie, thank you for setting aside some time to speak to me today. So how are you going? Doing well. Thank you so much for having me, Damien. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit about my story and getting people out into the outdoors. Awesome. So, well, let's get started. Maybe you can give us a little bit of a background about yourself. Um, have you always been into the outdoors? Um, and then, you know, what, what kind of sports and activities do you like to get up to? Yeah, so I grew up in Toronto, Canada, and um, I grew up in an era where basically, you know, you're young, you go outside, you leave the house at 8 a.m., you come back when it's dark and your mom's like, where have you been all day? And you're like, oh, I had so much fun. I met these people and we were playing in the park and we did all these activities. And in the summertime, I was pretty much always in the swimming pool. Like that's my number one activity when I was a kid. Um, I loved bike riding. Um, as a family, we didn't do a lot of hiking or camping, but I was always outside. And I was actually introduced to more of those types of activities. Um, through summer camp where my mom sent me away for a week and it was an overnight sleepaway camp. Um, we were in cabins and I was so lucky to be introduced to canoeing and hiking and other outdoor activities that I think that's what really started my love of getting outside. Um, and then my mom, she took me camping once. And uh, if you really want to hear the story about all the things we did wrong, um, and how we attracted a raccoon that decided to live on our campsite for the whole weekend that we were there. Um, and then I went camping and did outdoor activities with um, school. So I was lucky enough to be able to go cross country skiing. Um, I was always, always, always very active. I was on the swim team. I was on the volleyball team. Um, I just loved being active and kind of getting outside and doing activities. Um, and I didn't really hike like I do now um, until I started going on a lot of sustainable tourism type trips. I went to Costa Rica and had the opportunity to go hiking. And that's probably when, you know, I bought hiking shoes. I bought a backpack. I bought all the things that I needed, or at least I thought I needed to go on this trip. Um, had the opportunity to go to Thailand, had the opportunity to go to, uh, I said Costa Rica already. Um, to uh, the Galapagos Islands, like all kinds of different places, uh, South Africa, Australia. Um, and I really loved it. And then I moved to San Diego. And this is where really my love for hiking and backpacking started. Awesome. So what's the first hike or backpacking trip you went mm -hmm. on in uh, San Diego? Uh, well, the first one I went on San Diego was actually with the Wilderness Basics course. Okay. And um, I signed up for this backpack trip. It's, or actually it was a car camping trip. And I can explain that a little bit more. It just basically means you're going to drive your car out into the desert. And you don't have any of the modern luxuries. Like there, there's no toilets. There's no showers. There's no organized campground area. It's basically you're out in the desert. And um, yeah, it was an eye opener. I, I remember going on the hike and it was all sand and rocks. And yeah. I was like, hmm, this is hiking in San Diego. I don't really think I like it. Right. <laughs> I was like, what? I feel like I'm walking on a construction pile of broken concrete. Like that's how I really felt. And um, as the day went on, we did a really long day hike. It was probably 15 hours. I recall leaving at 7 a.m. from our campsite and getting back to our campsite at around 7 p.m. Like I remember coming down in the dark and um, our guide just or our leader led us on this hike. That was pretty strenuous. We were climbing over boulders. We were getting to the top of a peak. And I was like, okay, good. We're done. Let's go back to the campsite. I could really like 
let's have some drinks and have dinner. Like yeah. I'm done. Oh, and now, oh, he's so excited. Oh, now we're going to go cross over the top of these mountains. And we're going to go to this other mountain over here. And I was like, oh, okay. And then we came down in the dark and I was like, I had never done this type of activity. Yeah. And I was like, does this guy know what he's doing? Does he even know where he's going? Like I had to put my trust in him. Right. So finally we get back to the campsite in the dark. Had it, we didn't have our tent set up because we had camped at a different location the night before. Made all kinds of mistakes in setting up my tent, but we did have a nice dinner. And uh, after that, and then the next day we went on another, another uh, hike. So it was more of a car camp. And that was my first experience into uh, San Diego um, camping. And I have to say that when I had to sign up for my next trip in the wilderness basics course, I was like, I'd like something a lot easier. Like maybe yeah. get me more of a trip that's six to eight miles. I don't need to do a 15 miler in one day. Yeah. Um, and I had the totally opposite um, experience. Um, my trip wound up being like a three mile trip. And it was my first backpack in San Diego um, out in Anza Borrego desert. And it was to an area called Blair Valley. And this was a learning how to use your map and compass outing. And this was much slower. We had a group of four nurses who, to them, this was our luxury vacation and everything went slow. But for me, it was fantastic because every time our instructor said, we're going to do this task and she would assign some land nav task for each group to do, I did it every single time. And I got the best instruction on how to do map and compass and land navigation work. And from that, I fell in love. And it was really wonderful. My next outing was um, another backpack. And then we did a snow camp. Um, if you haven't been to snow camp ever before, it's uh, quite an experience. We went up to Mammoth and we camped out in the snow. Yeah. And uh, it was really interesting. I'm not going to say that I want to go snow camping every year because I really enjoy downhill skiing and I want to be inside a nice cabin with a hot tub and a warm fireplace. But uh, I know what to do in case I get stuck in the snow. And yeah. so I'm very grateful to the Wilderness Basics course. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. So, so what is it about hiking and backpacking you like so much now? Um, so there's two different things. One, I really like connecting with other people and sharing the experience with them. So to be able to teach them, um, you know, how to read a map or how to set up their tent and just hiking, just sharing nature with other people and taking them on this journey. When I go out for myself, it's kind of getting away from the computer, getting away from shopping, getting away from the concrete and just listening to the sounds of the birds. Like this morning I went on a hike and I saw a snake and it was, I was like, oh, I should get my phone out and take a picture. And I went, no, just enjoy the snake. Yeah. Just watch him, see what he does for a change, right? Like, I don't have to share this with everybody. There's National Geographic has amazing footage of snakes <laughs> if you want to see snakes, right? So I just watched the snake and uh, I just felt connected. Yeah, so I like connecting to nature and listening to the birds, the sounds and just taking in that fresh air. Yep. No, brilliant. Yeah, as you said, like uh, today's age, we're all kind of connected all the time yeah. and we want to be sharing or whatever and we forget to actually have an experience. So we do. Definitely. So, so it's good to see you know how to disconnect. So um, what uh, are some of your favorite destinations uh, in San Diego? Yeah, so locally, I live in an area called Poway, and we have some amazing hiking here. Um, the, I guess you could say infamous or famous potato chip rock. It's uh, a great hike. It's about seven miles round trip. And uh, if you're into getting that Instagram photo, you can take a look at potato chip rock online and you will see thousands and thousands of photos of this spot. It is a great spot to go to. Um, I really enjoy Torrey Pines. It's a state park and it's basically hiking right along the coast. So you're up high on the cliffs and you see the ocean. If you look out, sometimes you can see whales if it's the right time of year. 
and it's just beautiful to be out there. And then just outside of San Diego, my favorite place is the Dome Land. And this is where the wind has carved out holes in, let's say, um, a hillside. And it just looks like something out of bedrock, out of from the Flintstones. If you can remember that television program from yeah. way back when, that's what it kind of looks like out there. And uh, it's just got a fantastic view of the Sultan Sea. Okay. Um, other areas would be the calcite mines where there's slot canyons and you can walk through those slot canyons. And that's a lot of fun too. And those would be my favorite. Okay, awesome. So outside of California, have you gone uh, hiking anywhere else? Yeah, I've been hiking in Colorado, in Washington, um, in Utah, um, as well as Arizona, um, and New York, upper state New York in the Adi Adirondacks. Okay. So lots of fun places to go in the United States. If you ask me which was my favorite, I honestly can't tell you. I am so bad with names. Um, I can remember who I went with. I can visualize the peak in my mind, but don't ask me the name of the hike or the trail. I'm horrible. No, that's fine. No, I understand. Too busy enjoying to worry about the details. So, so that's a good thing. So what about what's on your hiking and backpacking bucket list? Yeah, I would really like to go to the Dolomites in Italy. Um, so that's a spot that's on my list. I've recently heard about Newfoundland in Canada, and my understanding is the fjords there are to be matched, if not better, than the ones in Norway. I have been to Norway as well and hiked there, and I really, really loved it. Unfortunately, when I did the Bazungan Trail, I think that's how you pronounce it, yeah. it's supposed to be like 15 feet wide or three meters wide, super narrow at the top, and we were completely fogged in. So we didn't realize that we never got to that spot, but I was really nervous because I was like, you could not see yeah. um, a meter in front of you. And I was like, mm, I'm ready to go back down. I don't yeah. need to fall off the side of a cliff. It's okay. So I would love to go back there to actually see it without all that cloud coverage. Yeah. So that would be a spot in Norway. Um, and like really, really, really would like to get to Iceland. Okay. That would be a wonderful place. Yeah. And then, of course, there's so many places in South America to discover. Like all of Patagonia would be amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, lots of places to venture to. Awesome. Oh, brilliant. So, tell us a little bit about uh, the Sierra Club and how did you get involved? Yeah. So, I was, um, I moved to San Diego in 2006 and I was at, um, an outdoor recreation store, REI. And um, it was one of their outdoor gear sales. And I overheard two people talking about this course. And I was like, what is it? So I'm like, can you tell me a little bit more about this? They're like, yeah, the Sierra Club has this course that's offered once a year from January to April, where you get to learn all about hiking, camping and backpacking. And I'm like, this sounds great. I can't wait. So I put it on my to-do list. And this is when, you know, Facebook wasn't really around yeah. back then, right? And so you actually had to Google it. And their website presence, well, it wasn't that great. So I was like, okay, I have to make sure I sign up for this course. And it was a live sign up. So I went. And that's how I got introduced to the Sierra Club. And the Sierra Club is an environmental organization. They do have a political side to them as well. And I stay mainly on the um, outing side. So getting people introduced to the hiking and the backpacking and the camping. And that's what I really love about the Sierra Club. And they're very open to getting everyone outside, no matter what your age is, no matter what your um, sexual orientation is, no matter what the color of your skin is. Um, they want to encourage everyone to be able to enjoy, explore, and protect our planet. So that's the Sierra Club's mission. Okay. Um, so I signed up for this Wilderness Basics course, and it's a 10-week program that we met, and it still happens except for in the time of COVID. We had to cancel um, this year. But we always meet on Tuesday nights. We have lectures for three hours, kind of in the TED Talk style, where they're 20 minutes each on different elements of hiking, camping, and backpacking. And we do four weekend outings. 
So we do what's called a primitive car camp, um, a land nav backpack, a regular backpack and a snow camp. So we try to cover everything. Um, and we do those every other weekend. So people get the, you know, they take the lectures and then they take what they've learned in the lectures and they put it into practical usage with um, two leaders that will take them out there. So if anything goes wrong, you have some experts because I don't think anybody is really an expert at nope. anything. I mean, we always learn every single day something new and I learn from my students as well as from other leaders and um, other people. And uh, I feel like I'm always learning something new, but we're there to help guide people through and to help build their confidence if they they don't have it right and if something happens in the middle of the night we're there yep. to talk to the person or if they didn't bring like when i was a student i forgot my food once you know like all these things that i've learned along the way i'm happy to share them with people so they don't do the dumb things that i did yeah <laughs> and how, how to avoid them so that's how I kind of uh, I got introduced to the Sierra Club through the Wilderness Basics course. I loved it. I made some amazing friends um, who are still my friends today. What is it? 14 years later or 13 years later. Yep. And um, I decided they were like, hey, we're going to take this leader training um, program through the Sierra Club. I'm like, OK, I'll come with you. Yeah. And I became I, I became a leader for the Sierra Club taking people on day hikes that was the first level and then I decided to be become a backpack um, leader as well and that's how I got into leading for the wilderness basics course okay awesome yeah. so right. well, I think this is a a, a very good lead in into us talking about how to get started in hiking and backpacking so to get started maybe you can give us a, a little bit of a difference between hiking and backpacking and then also the different forms of uh, hiking and backpacking yeah so um to me depending on where you are in the world people call it hiking people call it trekking and some people just call it a walk in nature right yeah. and so it depends where you are and then there's the whole mountaineering side of things right so i'm going to take it back to the hiking side and it's really where you're not on a concrete path and there's different levels of hiking. You know, uh, we rank our hikes as easy, moderate, hard, strenuous, and very strenuous. But that's all in the eye of the beholder. Something that you might think is hard, because I have lots, not, not you specifically, yeah. Damien, but just you, the general you, yeah, yeah. Um, I might think is easy just because I have years of experience on those types of trails or my fitness conditioning is better. Um, so I might be like, this is a super easy hike, but someone who's new to hiking, they may be like, this is hard. I'm not used to being on a path that has these rocks. Um, I'm not used to going up this elevation gain. I'm not, I'm not fit enough currently, but I will get there. So what's easy to someone could be hard to someone else. And yep. I think that we always have to think about that when we talk about what's easy and what's hard. Um, I consider, consider an easy hike is something where the ground is very flat. You have minimal kind of rocks sticking out. You don't have a lot of hills. Maybe you have some gentle rolling hills and it's a couple of miles or uh, a few kilometers, right? Yep. That would be an easy hike to me. You could, probably everybody could do it. Um, and then something that's more moderate is you may have steeper um, portions of the hike. It might be a longer hike. Uh, maybe the terrain has some more rocks in it. That would be more moderate. And then harder was, you know, it's steeper or it's going to take a longer period of time. Maybe you have more ups and downs, um, eventually always up, but it doesn't have to be. Um, some of the hardest hikes I've done are canyon hikes. Yeah. Like think about the Grand Canyon. You know, you're hiking down and everybody goes, oh, down is so easy. I love yeah. down. Yeah, hike into the Grand Canyon and then see how your legs feel after that hike the next morning. Your muscles have been working so hard at stabilizing you going down. That is a hard hike, yeah. but you don't really think so when you're doing it, right? And then you feel it the next day. Yeah. So that's how I kind of categorize the hiking. 
How is backpacking different? To me, it's you're carrying everything you need on your back to stay out overnight. And that's what makes a backpack different yeah. than a day hike. Yeah. And some people refer to backpacking as just multi-day day hikes or okay. overnight hikes. So I think that, you know, the term backpacking sometimes gets a little confusing for people. They're like, oh, I just saw backpacking with hiking. And I'm like, it is. Just you're going overnight. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just an extension to me, at least. Okay. And you can do, um, you know, just an overnight backpack to get started. You can do multi-day hike um, backpacks. You can do something called a through hike. And that's kind of, that's a backpack, really. Um, yeah. We have the Pacific Crest Trail here in California. It starts at the Mexican border, goes 2,600 miles all the way to the Canadian border. And people do that as a backpack and they take off like a few months and off they go and they decide they're going to through hike it. Um, other people decide I'm going to do sections of it as yeah. backpacking and other people decide, Hey, I'm just going to do sections. Like today I'm doing this part tomorrow. I'm going to do that part. And they do, they just day hike it. So yeah. I hope I've answered your question. What the differences are no, in the no. different kinds of hikes. No, it was perfect. Like you gave a really good overview and actually was going to answer one of the questions I had about section hiking and also through hiking, um, because uh, I think that creates a little bit of confusion for some people. So no, you answered it very well. Great, so, thank you. So, so basically hiking, is, do you think it's available to everyone? You don't have to, be, there's no age limitations really. Um, no real physical limitations? No, you know, the only challenge I see for people who may not be able to hike are those people in a wheelchair, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I don't feel that most trails are conducive to wheelchairs. There is a company that makes a hiking wheelchair, and I'm really, really excited about that because yeah. I think that everyone should be able to get out there. And they just need to have friends that are willing to push them. And it's kind of like um, a tire in the front and two in the back with rugged wheels yep. um, to get over those rocks. So do I think hiking is accessible to everyone? Yes and no. Uh, so like I said, people that are in a wheelchair, it might be more challenging for them unless they can get their hands on a wheelchair that's been um, adapted for hiking. I feel that people who um, are deaf can hike or have limited hearing capabilities. We just need to know how to communicate with that person when we're out on the trail. Um, there's a very famous blind hiker that um, has hiked numerous peaks. So you can hike if you're blind as well. Yep. Um, I don't think it matters the color of your skin. Um, hiking is available to everyone. Um, and uh, also age. You know, I've seen like two-year-olds and I am shocked at how fast <laughs> they can get up a trail. Like I was with one and I'm like, oh, we're gonna carry her the whole way, right? And they're like, nope, she's <laughs> just gonna be walking. You'll be amazed at how she can climb over these, these spots where I'm like, oh, I'm tired and she's still going. Yeah. So, you know, uh, young kids can go, there's special carriers you can take your child with you in. Um, and then people who are older too, like you can start hiking at any age. Um, in the Sierra Club, you'd be amazed. Uh, I was with the number of people who are in their 70s and 80s that are leading hikes for other people and sharing their knowledge and their experiences. And um, I, I was just blown away at how uh, fit some of these people were. So. Yeah, I think all ages too, and um, gender doesn't matter. And so, yeah, everybody can kind of get out there and hike. Um, you don't need a lot of things to go hiking. The most important thing, though, I think, is you need a comfortable pair of shoes that have good tread. Yeah. And then there's some things that I highly recommend you take with you when you go hiking, and they can be found all around your house. You don't need to go buy special things. So, what would so, yeah, some? I do think it's. Carry on. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, my apologies. No, no, because you were leading into um, some of the items you need to go hiking. And so I was thinking it was a good uh, adjunct to, 
you know, you kind of like indicate because like some people will go will be going like, oh no, I have to go hiking, I have to go to you mentioned one store, Ray, you have to go there, you have to buy all the latest gear. But you're going, no, you just go around your house and you can get whatever you need. So I think that's quite useful to know. Yeah. So obviously I think a good pair of shoes is important. I have seen people out there hiking in flip-flops. Hey, if that's your thing and you can like I can't do that. Like, <laughs> forget it. I'm just good walking in flip flops. Um, but you do want to protect your feet, especially your toes. So I would be concerned, depending on where you are, hiking in flip flops is like not ideal. Maybe if you're walking along a beach, okay, fine. You're not going to stub your toe on a rock. You're not going to get a stick maybe coming into your foot. Um, those are the things I would be really concerned about. So um, there are hiking type sandals that are made with like a cup over the toe. But just know if you're hiking in sandals, little rocks are getting in there all the time. It's yep. going to be painful. So I don't recommend that. So I recommend quality um, hiking shoes if you can get them. Running shoes work perfectly fine if they have a good tread. It's just your feet might be a little bit more sore. So um, the difference is on a, a hiking shoe, the sole is more stiff and that kind of um, protects your foot from all the rocks and the bends, whereas the running shoe is so soft and moves around that your foot has to move around more. So that's yeah. why your feet would just be more comfortable in a hiking shoe. Do you need it to be like a high cut hiking shoe? No, you just need a stable footbed. Yeah. So uh, whatever's comfortable for you, that's the one thing I would say. And then um, you just need a bag to put some stuff in. So it can be a cross shoulder type bag. It can be a backpack type bag. Um, it's just, I wouldn't carry like a shopping bag that you have to carry in your hand because yeah. you do like to have your hands kind of free. Um, and then I highly recommend carrying water with you. And, you know, uh, don't underestimate the amount of water that you need to take with you. You can always pour some water out, but it's hard to get more water and be drinking throughout your trail. You can, um, if you want to, you can put water in a bladder, which has like a hose so you can constantly keep drinking. You can use like one of these type bottles where, um, but that's heavy. Like I wouldn't carry that hiking because yeah. it's heavy, but it'll keep my drink really full, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we want to ensure that you take water with you um, and take some extra water because you never know if you're going to get stuck. And I can talk about getting stuck overnight, but let's just talk about bringing enough water for your day hike and maybe a little bit extra. If you do take a bladder, I kind of always recommend taking maybe a 500 milliliter bottle of water in addition. So if you drink everything, you still know you have that extra yep. water with, supply with you. Um, and then food. So it's really important. I know that a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to go hiking and I'll lose a lot of weight. No, <laughs> that's not the idea. We want to make sure you eat and that you have nutrition so you have the energy to get to the top or wherever your destination is and to make it back, right? So please eat. Um, and some tricks that I use is I like to hydrate before I go hiking. Yep. So maybe I'll drink a half a liter or a liter of water before I head out. That way it I'm already hydrated. And then I carry all my water anyway. Um, and make sure you have a good breakfast. Most people do hike in the morning, but whenever you go out hiking, make sure you do have food in you and carry some food as well. Um, another thing you'll want to take with you is um, some type of a light. So maybe a flashlight or a headlamp. And most of us have this in our home. You know, you also have the flashlight on your phone. Yep. So you could use that. Um, but I kind of look at a phone as that's my emergency device yep. and also my camera. So I don't want to use my, um, my phone as my flashlight, but it does come in handy as a flashlight. Uh, and you're going to be like, why do I need a flashlight? I'm going hiking at 7 a.m. It's daylight till like maybe 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m. Because you never know what can happen out on the trail. You could hurt yourself. You could come across an injured person that you're going to stay with. There's so many reasons why you what might keep you out on the trail longer. So we just want to ensure that you have some type of um, a light with you. Another item is um, a map and compass. Now, honestly, when I go hiking here in my local community, I'm not taking a map of yeah. the area, right? Like that's 
No, but if I'm going to go into a backcountry area where I've never been before, I'm going to take a paper map and a compass, and I, I want to know how to use it. And there's also, once again, on your phone, there's lots of um, um, apps right now, so you can see maps. There's Gaia GPS, there's All Trails. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of other maps um, that you can download these apps. You can start plotting your trail. You can follow a trail. And I think they're really good because they help you um, learn about the area that you're in. Now, would I rely 100% on all trails? No, it's crowdsourced information. Yeah. But if there's a lot of people having done that trail, chances are it's okay. But I check, you know, a couple of different resources. So I like my paper map. I like the apps. And I look at all of them when I'm making decisions. So that's another item. Um, you want to take a first aid kit. And I'm not saying a big first aid kit with everything you possibly need. But take the things that are important to you. So if you're on certain medications, be sure you take a, a day's worth of supply with you when you go out hiking. Um, and there's some other things like Benadryl um, may be important for you uh, because somebody might get an allergic reaction, you know, Tylenol, Advil, maybe Imodium. Sometimes people run into problems with their stomach, um, bathroom issues, um, some absorbent pads to ensure that if you do get cut, you know, that you can absorb blood, that you have bandages with you. And once again, there's um, an app you can download um, in the United States, at least from the American Red Cross, which tells you how to identify different types of problems. Like if somebody's having a heart attack, what to do. So that app is super handy. Or there's little booklets that come in first aid kits yeah. that you can just read through, like if something happens. Um, for myself, what I like to do is I like to know who I'm hiking with and if they have any ailments. So if, you know, somebody has seizures, I'm not going to say, no, you can't come with me. I just want to know what should I do if you have a seizure? You know, what should I tell people? If you have a heart condition, tell the people that you're hiking with so that we know what and tell us what to do if something happens to you during that episode. Or if you have diabetes, tell us what to do. Um, and I usually try to look up these things. So I think it's important to communicate um, if you have any ailments. So that kind of falls into my first aid category. Yeah. Um, blister bandages. Yes, those blister bandages are awesome to take with you. You never know when you're going to get a blister. So I yeah. highly recommend those. Um, maybe tweezers in case you get a splinter or a tick. Um, and there's lots of information out there. On, you can Google it. Uh, YouTube, you know, channels on what to put in your first aid kit. So I recommend that. Um, I recommend taking an extra layer of warm clothing. Once again, you never know when you get stuck out there. And depending on where you're hiking, it might seem hot when you start, but the temperature of the weather can change. So you do want to have a layer of warm clothing. Um, for myself, I usually just take a base layer, um, like a base layer top and a base layer, like tight. Yeah. Um, for the bottoms and I just they roll up so small and I just throw them in my pack um, and then sun protection right so you'll want either a hat that's wide brim covering your ears or a baseball cap um, sunglasses to protect your eyes and ensure that you're wearing sunscreen to protect your skin because that's your largest um, organ in your body and we want to ensure that it's kept safe um, also you know, loose fitting clothing is important. That helps you with sun protection as well. Did I miss anything in my list? Oh, fire starter. Yeah. So I live in California. We don't want to start a fire ever <laughs> when we're out there. That's not controlled. Um, but, you know, if you are stuck overnight and you do need to stay warm, um, being able to start a fire can be extremely helpful. And you just want to ensure that you know how to start a fire so you have matches, um, and if you have some, usually you can find some type of wood around you to be able to start a fire. After all, you're in nature, right? Yeah. But be very careful and cautious with that. Um, trying to think of what else that you might want to take. Some people really like to carry a whistle because okay. a whistle can carry sound when you're out in nature and you can blow that whistle if people are looking for you. So if you get lost. Yep. Um, and most backpacks now have a whistle on the chest strap and they're built into the backpacks and the day packs. 
uh, if you've seen that. But just a whistle is helpful. No, did I miss anything? Can you think of anything uh, that you would want to take? That oh, and then rain gear. Okay. So you depend. Like I'm in Southern California. We always laugh when people are like rain gear. Why do I need rain gear? Well, it's a second layer. It's warm. It helps with block the wind. Yeah. Um. So we talk about taking rain gear with us. It's one of those things we recommend. But like I said, rain gear could be a garbage bag. It doesn't have to be a $200 Gore-Tex jacket. Yeah. It can just be a 99 cent poncho from the dollar store, right? Like it doesn't have to be expensive. Like all these things that I've mentioned, um, you probably have them around your house. Yeah. So, no. So, yeah. So hiking is pretty accessible. Like basically any budget can pretty much go off and have a hike and be prepared. Yeah, and I recommend, um, you know, a lot of people will be like, uh, yeah, my friend has the stuff all in their pack. And I recommend you carry your own items if you can, if you're able to physically carry them, because you don't know if you're ever going to get separated. Oh, one thing I totally forgot, bathroom supplies. So, you know, if you're going for a two hour hike, chances are you're not going to have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. But if you're going for an eight hour hike and you didn't go in the morning, you might want to carry um, some toilet paper. You might want to ca carry a bag to pack the toilet paper out. Yep. And you might want to carry a little shovel to dig a hole. And if you want to know how to do that, happy to share that with you. <laughs> but um, in where I live, you're supposed to carry and pack out your toilet paper. So that's why you'd want to carry a bag and then maybe a Ziploc bag so that eh, nothing comes out, you know, but um, yeah. So, and then hand sanitizer. Yep. So you want to make sure you bring hand sanitizer with you. Yeah. Okay. So, I know that's a big question for people. They're always like, what happens if I have to go to the bathroom out there? <laughs> like that's, that's a huge concern for a lot of people. I don't want to go hiking because I might have to go to the bathroom, right? Um, so if you can talk about that and have a conversation on what to do, then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, no, definitely. So, so yeah. no, you're right. It is a question, isn't it? Because uh, not everyone's going for a one or two hour hike. So, and um, you're definitely going to need a pit stop uh, after eight hours. So. So, yeah. So it's better to be prepared. Definitely, definitely. And you guys have it way easier than us girls. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. I was talking to my son because we were because we're kind of in lockdown, but we go on these three or four hour kind of like city adventures or whatever. And, um, and then we were comment, and he was commenting like, um, "It must be hard for girls." Uh, yeah. No, definitely. So. <laughs> So what, what kind of skills uh, or knowledge do you really need? Like you, you mentioned, like, it's quite useful to be able to read a map, um, use a compass. So beyond that, what, what other things are kind of useful? Um, just understanding the area that you're in. So I highly recommend um, always checking the weather. Um, you know, depending on where you are, there's different weather websites that you can check what the weather is going to be like and it's not just the temperature um, but whether it's sunny or cloudy whether it's going to be windy whether it's going to be raining you know all of these different things play a factor into your decision as to whether you're actually going to go hiking that day and what things you're going to take with you right um, so looking at the weather is important and understanding um, if you're hiking, I would say also starting to learn uh, what the features are that are around you and what that looks like on the map. Um, so it's not just, okay, I'm on this spot because the app tells me I'm on this yep. spot. It's to look at what the topography on the map looks like and how that relates to what it looks like in the real world. And then also, uh, you know, I start saying things like, I, I don't want people to time their hikes but to get used to how long, like how long did it take me to cover a kilometer or a mile? Yep. Okay, so it took me maybe 25 minutes or a half hour to cover this period. Well, if my hike is this, it's like a 10 mile hike. Well, it might take me from doing a half hour mile. That's going to take me five hours. 
So I have to plan for that and know what when the sun's going to set so that I can be back at my car still in daylight unless I want to hike at night. So that's something that I would be mindful of. So it's, well, I don't say, I don't want you to watch, uh, keep an eye on your your watch all the time, but I do want you to realize how long it takes you to traverse a certain, um, an area, right? And sure, you might walk in the city, you might do a kilometer in 10 minutes or, but once you're out on the trail, that might take you longer. Like most people hike at about two and a half miles per hour is kind of like the average. And depending on if you're carrying a backpack, that might slow you down, depending on, you know, are there lots of rocks and boulders you have to climb over? Do you have to climb over logs? You know, these things all slow you down yep. or do you take a lot of pictures oh my god everybody now is like oh, i got a picture of this gotta get a picture of that and uh when you're taking pictures i'm going to tell you that adds a lot of time to your travel time and the number of people you're hiking with if you're hiking with you know two people you might cover that ter- that terrain way faster than if you're t- hiking with 15 people yep so those are just kind of some things to know when you're going out there. Um, what other knowledge? I'm um, just trying to think about other things that you want to learn about. You also want to kind of look at where you're going. Maybe you'll do some research on the internet just about are there going to be water sources around you? So here in San Diego, we're in desert. Usually we're carrying a lot of water with us and water is heavy. So I'm going to be bad with my pounds and my kilograms here, but um, a liter of water. And it's funny, I talk in liters when it comes to water. And then I'll talk about the weight of it in pounds (laughs) because I'm in the United States. So um, it's like two pounds for every liter of water. So close to a kilogram for a liter of water. But when you're carrying three liters of water, that's like three kilograms or six pounds that you're carrying. That's kind of heavy. So Um, If you're going into areas where you do have water sources like rivers, streams, creeks, lakes, um, it's good to know how to filter that water. So are you going to use a filter to clean the water? Are you going to use iodine, um, uh, tablets or liquid to purify that water? Are you going to use like a scary pen? There's lots of ways you can clean the water so that you can drink it. And, you know, even if you think this is a mountain fresh, it looks beautiful, it's pristine water, you've got to be careful. There's parasites, right? So you yeah. want to ensure that you kill the bacteria. Nobody wants to get a parasite. Like, <laughs> no thanks. You can drink that chlorine tasted water. It's okay. Put a little bit of some mint drops or something <laughs> in it to kill the bad taste, right? So yeah, so it's good to know where your water resources are. Um, The other thing we have to keep an eye out here in California is there are fires and uh, wildfires can break out at any time. So you want to ensure that you know your your routes like, okay, if a fire breaks out here, well, maybe I can't go back to the trailhead the way I came. What are my other ways that I can exit this area? Because the way I came in might not always be the closest um, to exiting. And same with like if somebody has an injury, right? You want to know where the closest ranger station is or where the closest hospital is so that you can take them to that place or um, knowing like if I go on a hike here in my neighborhood um, I have local mountains here sure I can enter off one trailhead but I can exit in a different spot and get to a road a lot faster than backtracking all the way if I have somebody that's injured with me or if it's late like I'm going to tell you when I first started hiking oh, I made so many mistakes. Um, And I learned from so many people that I was like, oh, yeah, it's really good to know where you parked your car. Because if you enter the park in one spot and you exit in another spot and you're new to San Diego and it's dark, oh, you got to find. And people are like, well, where'd you park your car? I'm like, yeah, at the trailhead. Which trailhead? (laughs) I don't remember. There are five trailheads to that park and you came out a different exit. I'm like, yeah, okay, well, I'm going to find my car. And it wasn't a time where I had a car where you push the button and it had yeah. the alarm go off. <laughs> like It wasn't that time. So I was like, okay, I got to find my car. So, 
No, very... I think, yeah, do we cover all the things that you might want to learn about? No, you covered quite a lot of territory. So a lot of things uh, I definitely wasn't thinking about. So um, I've also had many misadventures. <laughs> I guess I've got one of the, like uh, the mentality, you go out with your friends and you don't really think about any of these things. And then you're coming back at night and it's completely pitch black and you don't know exactly how to get out. So it becomes more of a misadventure than you kind of like initially thought it was going to be. So no, so all of your points are very valid. So well, I guess this is a good lead into what are some of the risk factors you should kind of be uh, looking out for and, you know, what are some of the precautions? So you mentioned fires are certainly an issue in um, California, um, but what are some of the other things you should be uh, concerned about? So we talked about weather yep. and I think that when you're in the mountains, the weather can change like instantaneously. You could be hiking in beautiful, sunny weather and then all of a sudden a storm rolls in. So you should be prepared. Like, do I need to hunker down for the night and am I going to have to stay here? And do I have everything that I could actually survive for one night out in the wilderness? Right. Yep. So, and I kind of say that for like every person should be able to do that um, for themselves. But even if you're with a group of people, you should all be able to um, at least, uh, I'm not saying share your resources, but you should be able to stay overnight as a group as well um, and have enough food, right? Yep. Can't rely on one person to bring everything. No. Um, the other thing is, uh, depending, if you're going to hike in a group or are you hiking solo? So, you know, there's things you have to consider if you're hiking by yourself, especially as a female, you know, um, when you run into other people, um, probably not a good idea to let them know that you're hiking by yourself. I do find that a number of people are very, very friendly on the trails, right? But unfortunately, you do get people who are predators, just like you do in the city, and they may want to harm you. Yeah. And so I think as an individual person hiking, you do need to be prepared. I have friends that carry um, different things with them. Uh, like they'll carry an air horn. So that way, you know, they could blow it in somebody's ears if they're trying to get away from them. And at least it's a distraction and that they can run. Um, pepper spray or bear spray, um, not only for animals, but for humans. Like if somebody does decide to attack you, you could spray them and get away. Um, I'm not a person that believes in guns, so I would never carry yeah. a gun with me, but there are people, so be aware. Um, I'm trying to think of what else, and a whistle. You know, a whistle can protect you because you can blow that whistle and it's really loud, right? Louder than your voice. So it's something to take with you when you're hiking solo. Even if you get hurt, you can blow that whistle. And I know yeah. I'm kind of saying about getting hurt and I don't want to scare people because hiking is really, really safe. But I think if you bring these things with you, you have them in case of something happening. Now, one of the other areas that I'm going to say people get scared about is like, they're like, there's animals when I go hiking. <laughs> what if an animal finds you? I'm like, oh my God, you're so lucky. You got to see an animal <laughs> in nature. You don't know how lucky you are because animals don't like to be around people. <laughs> they like to usually hide, except for those animals that have been habituated because people have been giving them food. So don't feed the animals, yeah. right? Number one. Um, and then, yes, I would always research the area you're going to go hiking in or backpacking. So, you know, find out, are there snakes? Okay, what are the snakes? What are the ones that could hurt me? What do I do not to aggravate the snake? If I do get a snake bite, what should I do? So, you know, tip is just slow down. Um, try to get yourself evacuated from the area if you can, or if somebody needs to come in and get you, and then mark the area of the snake bite, and then just put a time. And if you get a picture of the snake, because we all have our phones in our hand all the time anyway, get a picture of that snake so the doctors can identify what kind of ven anti venom they need to give you. Um, but chances of being bit by a snake are very uh, slim, yeah. right? But keep your eyes open, right? Like you want to be looking around. Um, also, I don't recommend wearing earbuds in your ears or listening to music when you're out on the trail because you can't hear animals or people yeah. around you. 
and you want to kind of hear them. If you do do fitness type training hikes, maybe just wear one earbud so you can still hear. Um, and uh, the other thing is, you know, know about bears, know what to do if you encounter a bear, know what to do when you encounter a cougar, know what to do when you encounter a mountain lion, right? Um, for different animals, there's different things. For some animals, like a mountain lion, you want to make yourself really big and back up slowly, but keep maintaining that eye contact, right? Like you, and you might want to throw something at the foot of the mountain lion to scare it away. These animals don't want you. They're trying to protect something, yeah. right? Like they're trying to protect their cubs or their babies or something. So just be mindful of that. I'm trying to think of what other things that are risks. Well, the sun is always a risk. Um, you know, it can do lots of damage. It can dehydrate you. It can give you heat exhaustion, heat strokes. So ensure that you're drinking, you're wearing a hat, you're protecting your eyes with sunglasses, you're protecting your skin with loose clothing, um, sunscreen. So that's something else to be aware of. Um, river crossing would be something that I would be very concerned about. Um, the water can be very strong depending on where you are. Uh, depending on where you are, like try to look for a spot that's an easier crossing where the water isn't moving as fast or as flowing so furiously. Um, if you're where, using hiking poles, they're great. So you can always have three points of contact yep. when you're crossing. Um, I would kind of always look upstream and cross across if you're in a group you can do different techniques to get the whole group across the water um you know people are like oh i'm going to walk on the rocks because that way my shoes won't get wet if it's a very shallow crossing be careful because sometimes you just slip off the rock and then you twist your ankle or like i did i leaned on my hiking pole and snapped it in half <laughs> uh sometimes you know what it's a lot better just to walk through the water Yep. Um, do you take off your shoes when you walk through the water? Well, that's your choice. But if you can't see your feet, that means you can't see what's in the water and you might stub your toe. Yep. So I'm of the thing of, you know, like just walk through with your shoes. They'll dry on the other side, bring dry socks with you and change them out. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of what other hazards you might come across when you're out there. I mean, if you're hiking in the winter time, you've got to be mindful of how cold it's going to get out there. And that's why we talk about carrying extra warm clothing. Um, we do have a saying here in, Cal in California, and maybe it's around the world, that cotton kills. And we recommend you wear synthetic fabrics when hiking because they'll wick away moisture and they'll dry faster. Like yep. um, jeans and a sweatshirt, if it rains, that's going to be wet and heavy. Right. And we don't want you to get hypothermia and be cold. So, yeah, trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, you can also take a sun umbrella. Yeah. If um, you're like hiking in the desert, for example, sun umbrellas are great. You can create your own shade. So that's a fantastic thing to think about as well. Um, oh, and then, of course, I forgot this because I live in California and yeah. San Diego. We don't have bugs. So we don't have mosquitoes. We don't have them. However, if you're anywhere where you're going to get lots of mosquitoes, um, horse flies, deer flies, you know, like there's all kinds of insects out yeah. there that just want to bite you. And I know, like when I grew up in Toronto, we went to Algonquin Park. Nobody else was having problems with the insects, just me. The mosquitoes loved me. My friends would be like, oh, come sit beside me so the mosquitoes will get you instead <laughs> of me. So you might want to consider um, some insect repellent type items. Just make sure you don't spray anything with DEET on um, like your tent or your backpack because DEET will eat away at that. So you kind of got to think, what's it doing to my skin? Yeah. Um, so you do want to wash that off quite quickly when you can um there's a uh, thermosel has a product it's a uh, like a you can put it on a stove a backpacking stove and it kind of creates a bubble around you so that the bugs don't come to you yeah you can wear um head nets over so that way the bugs aren't coming into you um there's clothing that's netted type clothing as well if you're in real areas that have lots of insects and uh 
Yeah. And then of course there's tarantulas and scorpions, depending on where you are. And you just have to know how to handle them. Like yep. don't touch them. <laughs> what I recommend. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Don't, don't poke them with a are... stick or like, uh, you know, keep your, keep your curiosity in check and leave them in their environment. And you just keep in your environment. Yeah. I mean, it's great to look at them. And uh, I just don't think you need to touch everything. It, you know, it's, it would be like, what if there was some giant out there going, oh, I like your hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it'd be like, oh, thanks. Uh, no, I didn't want to be petted today. <laughs> yeah. so. No, definitely. So what about um, multi-day hiking or backpacking? Um, so what are some of the equipment you kind of like should consider for that? Yeah, so obviously you're going to want some type of shelter. Now, some people like to sleep under the stars, and that's perfectly fine if the weather's um, fine for that. Uh, but a tent, and there's different kinds of tents. There's like just tents that are more of a shelter. There's tents that have two ply lining, so to speak, like a fly and a tent underneath it. Um, there's all kinds of tents. You know, if you're looking at backpacking, you're probably going to want something a little bit lighter. Yeah. And um, I personally like tents that have side doors versus a front entry tent. Um, I'm tall. So getting in and out of a tent that has a front entry with a small um, entrance can be challenging. Um, if you're going to share a tent with another person, it's nice to have doors on each side of the tent so that they can get in and out easily. And okay, to everybody out there, when they say a four person tent, yes, they mean four people side by side, <laughs> not spread out. So when you look at this four person tent or this two person tent, it's not for you and all your stuff. It's for you. So I just want to let you know, because a lot of people are like, there's no way we're going to fit two people in there with yeah. all of our stuff. So what you want to look for is some vestibules on the side. And those are just like your fly kind of comes over the door areas and there's some extra storage space. Yeah. So those are called vestibules. Um, when you're buying a backpacking tent, I kind of always look at how heavy is that tent going to be? Because you're going to have to carry it. And you want to be mindful of um, how big it packs. And when we're packing our backpacking tent, usually what we'll do is I'll take the poles and separate them from the actual tent and pack the tent in the backpack, but maybe the poles will go on the outside of your backpack. Um, there's all kinds of information on how to pack. Um, yeah. I don't think we want to go into that right now. No, no. Um, but you're going to have also when you go backpacking a larger pack to carry everything in. Um, and what I recommend you do when you're trying to decide on what that pack's going to be is go to an outdoor store um, look at all the things that you're going to need to take with you. So a sleeping bag is an item. Uh, another item other than a sleeping bag is like a quilt. People are tending to use quilts now as well. A sleeping pad. So um, some people will say, I don't need a sleeping pad. I can sleep on the ground. Um, it doesn't hurt my bones. But what I learned was a sleeping pad keeps you warm from the cold of the ground. Yeah. So the earth is usually quite cold. So it'll keep you warmer. All different kinds. There's um, EVA foam type pads. There are um, self inflating pads. There are pads that are more like air mattresses that you blow up. You just want to ensure that you get some type of a sleeping pad that is comfortable for you, long enough, wide enough. And some of them are noisy. So, yes, it might weigh next to nothing. And when I say next to nothing, I'm, I'm like talking uh, a pound or less than like half a kilogram or something like that but and there's probably even lighter right um but they're crinkly and they're loud because they've put some kind of uh, mylar fabric and stuff in there that makes them loud so test them out in the store if you can right like if you can go to an outdoor store and you can i recommend getting in that sleeping bag now with covid they might not let you but blow up that air mattress, lie on the air mattress, get in the sleeping bag, see if it's comfortable for you. Is it roomy enough for you? Is it long enough for you? Yeah. There's sleeping bags that have hoods, there's mummy shapes, there's square ones or rectangular ones. So test them out in the store. Um, so we got sleeping pad, sleeping bag, tent, 
your backpack. You're going to need some type of uh, cooking, uh, like a stove, if you want to have warm food. There are people who I know that can go backpacking with, they don't take food that has to be cooked, but if you are a person that wants to cook your food, you'll want to have a stove with fuel and a pot. Um, Trying to think of what else. You may or may not want to carry some type of a plate, um, depending on the food that you're cooking out there. Um, your own fork, knife, spoon. Um, you don't really want to be sharing these things with other people. You'll want to take um, some type of a cup to drink water, or if you make coffee or tea, because making warm beverages is really great at night or if it's cold out. Yep. Um, trying to think. You have your flashlight. An item that I really, really love is uh, these. They have solar inflatable lights now that you just blow up. And you can uh, put them on the outside of your backpack. They charge up during the day uh, in the sunlight. And they're great to use at night. Um, You can put them in your tent also. Like if you're heading out at night to go to the bathroom, for example, I recommend turning on a light at your tent so you can find your tent when you come back. Right? Oh, speaking of going to the bathroom, you want to take your bathroom supplies. Um, You might also want to take, depending where you are, some um, like wet wipes, um, just so that you can kind of wipe your body down at the end of the day if you don't have the ability to go into a stream or something to get water to wipe yourself off with. Um, A way to um, clean water. So, you know, whether that's going to be a pump, whether it's going to be tablets, if you don't, if you have a water source near you. So you want to find camp spots where you have a water source. Um, you might want trekking poles yep. to offload some of the weight from your backpack. Um, there's a lot of people that really, really, really love hiking with poles. And there's some people who don't like hiking with poles. So it depends. It's up to you. Um, hiking poles are really good, though, when you go backpacking because it offloads a lot of the, the weight of your pack. So I, I do recommend it. Um, and it takes a lot of pressure off your knees and your hips and your other joints as yeah. well by having those trekking poles with you. Um, trying to think if I missed anything. Oh, extra clothing. Um, highly recommend at least two pair of hiking socks. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, one pair might get kind of wet yeah. while you're hiking and sweaty. Um, so you have another pair Um and you want to kind of wipe down your feet because you're going to have all like grit and stuff. And that's what can um, also cause blisters in your yep. shoes. Um, oh, speaking of shoes, when you go backpacking, it's really nice to take another pair of shoes. Um, if I can say Crocs are great because they're super lightweight and um, you let your feet kind of expand and they can breathe in another type of shoe at night. So it's really good to give your foot that chance to relax. So they're not always in your hiking um, footwear that you're wearing throughout the day. Um, If it's cold, um, down booties are really good as well. And there's some that have a a good sole on the bottom so you can walk around outside. You just have to be careful when you're out in the desert because you might get little cactus spines. Yeah. Oh, and if you're out in the desert, a tip that we always recommend is bring a comb with you so you can flick off the... um, we call them choya, but like uh, the spines of a cactus. You can okay. just pull them out of you with a comb. Yeah. So just a little tip there. Um, trying to think what else for backpacking. You've got your food. Oh, some if you like some type of a sit pad, something to sit on. So like I said before, the ground is usually cold. You might find a nice rock. You might find some like um somewhere to sit, but you don't want to be cold and you want to be comfortable, right? So there's a lot of these really cool ultralight camping chairs out there right now, which weigh about half a kilogram a pound. That's a luxury item yeah. for me. Um, I take just an EVA foam pad and I have a chair converter that I use to make a chair just to like relax my back. Um, and I use it also to stretch. I use it also to put all my gear on and I use it as an insulating layer underneath my air mattress. So that's kind of like one of my luxury items that I take with me. Yeah, I think we covered probably everything for backpacking um, that I can think of. And another thing you might want to consider is if you've never slept out in the wilderness before, is 
what, how are you going to sleep without a pillow? Right. A lot of people love their pillow. So you can buy um, backpacking ultralight pillows that you can take with you. Or if you have a stuff sack, you can shove all your clothes into that stuff sack and close it up. And that can be your pillow. Yep. So that's just something else to think about. Yeah. Pretty extensive. So like I think you've covered <laughs> everything. No, brilliant. So lots of things there and lots of information which I think are pretty valuable. So so I think um, to sum it all up, uh, if you had one reason why anyone should try hiking or backpacking at least once in their life, what would it be? Oh, to explore nature and to see something you've never seen before and to just um, you know, for backpacking, it's to get to that place that you can't get to with a car, right? That's the beauty of backpacking. It's getting out to see a wonderful place, to challenge yourself, to sleep under the stars. Um, and, and it's just wonderful to be able to do that. And even if you've, you know, you're really scared, I say try it. And there's different ways to trying it in the sense of if you, um, you've never backpacked before, I say, you start with hiking, then you kind of go camping, and then you pretend that you're going on a backpack, but you really have your car just like eight feet away from you. Yeah. So if you need something, you just go to your car and get it, and then you make a note of that for when you do a real backpack. And then maybe for your real backpack, you just go a mile or a kilometer into an area, and you set up your tent, and you go on a day hike, and you explore, and then you sleep in that tent, and Sure, your car might only be, you know, a 20 minute walk away, um, but if you need it, it's there, right? It's take small steps. Don't yeah. go, oh, I'm going to do a two week backpack and it's going to be my first experience. <laughs> no, start small. Um, and with the hiking, I think it's just really a great way to uh, stay young, um, be fit and get connected with nature and away from all of our technology. And that's why I would recommend people get out there and at least give it a shot. No, great. So, so on that point, um, so how do people connect? So like basically, you know, maybe your friends and family are not really into hiking. You know, you've gone out a few times by yourself and it's great, but you actually would like to hang out with a bunch of people who are into it. So what are some of the ways you can kind of find other people who might be into hiking or backpacking? Yeah, so, um, you know, we all have our love-hate relationship. Maybe some of us love Facebook more than others. Um, but Facebook is a great place to learn about where you can go hiking and to find other groups and like-minded people. You know, wherever you live or wherever you're thinking about going to in the world, you can type in city name, hiking group, and you can find people. Now, you always have to be cautious of who you're going out to meet with. In um, the United States, we do have the Sierra Club, which has a free, we do free hikes for the community. Um, we have leaders that uh, are trained in how to take people hiking and backpacking. And so the hiking is all free. Sometimes there are costs for backpacking because there's permits and things like that that have to be covered. Um, and sometimes there are fundraisers too. Yep. Um, there's also meetups. Depending on where you live in the world, you might have meetups as an option. I would just always say, you know, if you're going with a meetup group, just uh, try to learn as much as you can about hiking and the place you're going to. So you're somewhat self-sufficient and you're not relying a hundred percent on that meetup leader because it is a meetup, right? Like this person is not, has may not have been trained. They may be trained in taking outings. Um, there are also paid guides. So in different parts of the world, depending on where you're going, um, look and see if there's a guide that you can hire that will take you. And I recommend looking at reviews. What have other people said about going with this particular person um I, i'm trying to think of other groups uh, and outdoors type places you know you can find people through instagram uh, like i mentioned i've been on some, um, a new app called clubhouse and i've been meeting yeah. people from around the world there and you start making connections it's like anything you know if you meet people you you do need to uh 
I don't want to say be wary of who you're going out with, but I do recommend that if you decide you're going to go with a group of people you've never met before is to let someone know. And no matter, even if you're just going solo hiking or with a group is tell someone, where are you going hiking? Um, you know, where did you drive your car there? You know, tell them where you parked your car, your license plate number. So I check in when I come and then check in with them when they come back. Yep. So you say, oh, I finished my two hour hike. Right. Because people go missing all the time. Um, I don't want to scare anybody with that. But if you have this kind of plan that you share with somebody and I, I'm the worst at it, like I will tell somebody, OK, here's my plan. This is where I'm going hiking. This is when I'll be back. And then I forget to call them. Yes. Right. So I say in my plan, make sure you call me before you call emergency services. <laughs> I'm probably the person who's at the restaurant enjoying a meal after my hike with my friends. And I've just forgotten to call you. So, but we do want to kind of put those things into place so that people know that you've got home safely, right? After your hike. And so that's something that I highly recommend for people to do as well. But yeah, uh, meetup groups, Facebook groups, you can find people through Instagram, through Clubhouse, um, your Sierra clubs. There's all, a lot of other organizations, I'm sure, in other countries that are similar to the Sierra Club, outings groups that you can find. Um, and that's where I think you'll find a lot of people to go hiking and camping with. And also you'll meet people at the trailhead. Yeah. So that can be a way too, right? No. So hopefully you can find a friend and go out with a friend. I always recommend going with a buddy. Yeah. Right? It's no, the best definitely. Way. Awesome. Well, at least if you join one of these groups, you may develop those kind of friendships uh, like you apparently have. So you can, you know, you find people like-minded who want to go off and have similar kind of experiences. So no, great advice. So now let's change tact a little bit. What's your definition of adventure? Yes, to me, an adventure is whatever you want to do that challenges yourself to do something new. So um, I kind of think of adventures as some type of outdoor activity um, where I'm learning something new, I'm pushing myself, and I have some type of a challenge. And yeah, that's what I think of an adventure. Um, life is an adventure because every day I think we're learning something new. We're experiencing something new. Um, and the best adventures are usually the ones that you didn't plan out yeah. and where you meet some amazing people. And yeah, like I, I still remember my very first backpacking trip with my friend Tracy and uh, that, we didn't even last 24 hours on our <laughs> first, my first backpacking trip out in Algonquin Park. But I, as much as in the moment, it probably wasn't my favorite thing to do. It puts a smile on my face every time I think about it. And that's kind of what I think adventures are, right? They might not be perfect, but you learn something and you have a lot of fun and you have stories to share and you're like, I can't wait for the next one. What is it going to be? Yeah. Where is it going to take me? What am I going to do? Who am I going to meet? No, yeah. definitely. No, brilliant. So what would you say to others? Um, like you're obviously a very outdoorsy person and like to get out there, challenge yourself. You know, why they should consider, you know, adding a little bit more time outdoors, have an adventure and new experiences? Um, well, when I look at uh, just getting outside, like, like let's say you're at home all day working on a computer that nine to five your body is not made for that your body is made to move so whatever movement you choose to do I just highly encourage it it will keep you young you know I've always said I think fitness is the fountain of youth and if fitness for you is going to a gym and lifting weights go do it if if you know if for you it's getting on a stand-up paddleboard and paddle go do it if it's just going for a walk in the neighborhood get out there do it just moving your body will give you those endorphins and give you energy and make you smile and feel good and it might, you only have one body so we have to take care of it right yep. and 
I want everybody to live their fullest life and be able to be active and move and have that functional fitness, right? Like you want to be able to, when you're 70, 80, 90, a hundred, you want to be able to be self-sufficient. You don't want to be stuck in a hospital bed, watching TV with your mouth gaping open. And is that all that's left in life, right? You want to be able to, um, you know, get yourself showered in the morning, get yourself dressed, be able to go for a walk in your neighborhood, huh. make your dinner um, and, and do stuff. So I think that if you're active throughout your life, you know, you'll be able to live a good life well, well, well into your old age, whatever that is for you, you know, a hundred, hundred plus. No, no, very good advice. And what about the adventure and the new experiences kind of part, you know, do you, what, what do you think are the benefits for having a little bit more adventure, trying to have some kind of experiences? Yeah, I think it's great. Like when people ask me, you know, where do you want to go for vacation? I'm like somewhere I've never been to before, right? <coughs> because you can totally, um, you'll, to me, that's an adventure. Like going to another country where you don't speak the language and overcoming, you know, that, that ability to communicate with somebody, that's fun, right? Like, oh, yeah. I can't speak this language, but somehow I connected with you, whether we showed each other pictures, whether we use sign language, whether I learned a little bit about your language, and then you're communicating back with me, that's an adventure. That's, I encourage people to do that. Learn about other cultures, try other foods, get a, get try something different because you never know what you're going to fall in love with. Right. And um, now we're kind of in this world where, you know, there's a lot of people posting a lot of pictures on a lot of awesome places and things that they've done. And if you get inspired by just one of those things, go do it. Go like, I, I don't know. It's this energy that you get by trying something new. Right. Like you never know who, what you're going to fall in love with. You might find a whole new passion out there uh, of a thing that you like to do. You might meet someone that, you know, that you fall in love with, or you meet people that stimulate you, um, that intellectually that you meet along the way. And you, you know, we're always learning every day. And to me, and that's the adventure, right? It, and I, I guess, you know, does it have to be something epic? Like, oh, I'm going to paddle across, you know, from San Diego to Catalina Island, and it's going to take me 16 hours. And no, it doesn't have to be that. An adventure is what you choose your adventure to be. You create your own adventure and it can be something epic and it can be something small and simple, but it's what you've decided your adventure is. And that's what I think is most important is you live your life to the fullest and you love the life that you're living. Yep. Right. And if you don't love the life that you're living, what can you do to change it? Right. <laughs> is it, is it just taking a step outside? Is it maybe getting back on that bicycle that you had? Maybe it's um, going to the local Harbor and renting a canoe and having someone take you canoeing, you know, it, it could be different for everyone. And we're all in a different spot in our lives as to what we think is adventurous. Yep. You know, I, I know people look at my, I remember my friends are like, oh, I live vicariously through you. You're doing all these cool things. I'm like, you can do them too. Just go. <laughs> There's nothing holding you back but you. Yep. No, very good points. I think this is a good lead into the other question I'd like to ask um, people, especially in our age group, because a lot of people are approaching 40 um, or even 50, and then they have like a negative vibe or they, uh, you know, have some anxiety or, you know, oh my God, it's all kind of downhill from there. So what would you say to those people? Because obviously you have a completely different perspective. So it's, it's um, surround your people with, uh, surround yourself with the people and how you want to be, not the people who are going to bring you down. Yeah. Right. And I know that's kind of hard to say, because if it's, you know, a family member or someone that you're married to, and they're the ones who are always saying, no, you can't do that. then that's all you're going to hear. But if you surround yourself with people who are like, yes, you can do this. Um, 
you're going to get that positive feedback and you will be able to do it. So I say surround yourself with the people who you want to be most like. And if you, you know, if you want to hike, surround yourself with people that hike. If you want to mountain bike, start getting to know people that mountain bike, get into a, a group with them on through some social media channel, learn about those activities and build that confidence. Cause I think with knowledge comes confidence and you can do all of these activities. So I wouldn't let them hold you back, yep. so to speak. And, and it doesn't matter how fit you are. I know sometimes people say, well, I'm really out of shape. I, you know, I, I used to work in the fitness industry. I, and people would be like, well, I, I can't go to the gym because I'm fat. <laughs> And I, and I can't even lift these weights. And I'm like, well, guess what? Nobody could lift these weights the first time they came here. Like, sure, some people could, but, you know, you've got to start somewhere and you have to start with who you are. And if it's just a walk in your neighborhood, you know, and you're doing a couple of blocks, great. That's what you start with. And then maybe the next day you go a little further and then maybe you start going on a trail and then you introduce a hill and then there's no race. This is your life. Yeah. Right. So you can set a goal like, okay, in a year, I want to climb this peak. Well, we don't all just start. Okay. I'm going to climb a peak and I'm going to go today. <laughs> no, we all start somewhere. Right. Yeah. And as a baby, you, you couldn't run. Like when you came out of your mother's womb, you had to start, you started, you just sat there then you crawled then you walked then you learned how to run. Then you learned how to skip then you learned how to ride a bike. It was steps. And I think people have to remember that just because you're 40 or 50, it's never too late to learn something new. But you have to start at the basics. You, yep. you can't just be like, oh, I'm a, like, so what? I'm a good hiker. That doesn't mean I'm going to be a great mountain biker. <laughs> I have to start at the bottom of mountain biking. Or sure, I, I can canoe. That doesn't mean I'm going to be a great stand-up paddler. I might have some skills that I can transfer easily, but I have to learn how to balance on the stand-up paddle board. So it's, everybody has to start somewhere. And I don't think anybody should ever be ashamed of like they don't know how or and always feel free to ask questions because no one should ever feel bad like to ask a question, especially, you know, if you're going into an outdoor store. Yeah, like, I, I know nothing about mountain biking. So of course, if I'm going to go into a store and be like, Hey, I don't really know anything about mountain biking. What can you tell me? What type of bike should I be looking for? And ask those questions. Right. And then you can start. It, it, it just starts with the question and saying, I'm interested and I want to do this and putting that out there. And then how do you, what are the small steps you need to take? Don't think about that huge goal at the very end. Yeah. It's like the baby steps in between, right? Yeah. I'm sure that a lot of people didn't, like they may have had the dream of climbing Mount Everest, but they couldn't go do that tomorrow. They had to do a lot of training to get there. Yeah, no, you're right. Like, so I think the biggest limitation, a lot of people said they have an expectation, I'm older, I should have a certain level of skill if I, and I'm not prepared to go down and start a baby step. So they kind of like a, already start, no, I'm not going to be able to do it because I'm, I don't have the skill because I, they're worried about what other people are thinking. And it's like, well, you're 40 now. Don't worry about what people are thinking. Just go off and do it. Yeah. Well, my friend, she just bought a stand up um, surfing paddle board and she's, just over 60 and she's yeah. decided she's going to learn how to sub surf this year and i'm excited because i bought a, a stand-up uh, board last year to learn how to surf as well and um yeah i'm going to be learning this year how to do that activity too and guess what i am going to fall a lot <laughs> <laughs> that's just what it is right if you yeah. don't try you don't fall you don't make mistakes you don't learn true no very good so, so what's your definition of living your best life or what I call a uh, legendary life? Very good question. For me, it's um, being able to do the activities that I've always wanted to do and to do them um, hopefully without getting injured or hurt. Um, as we age, I, I do think it's, uh, you know, injuries they're inevitable your 
your body is slowing down. Like I can't re- change the signs of aging, but what I can do is I can continue to be active. I can continue getting outside and living my best life is being able to get outside, do the activities I want to do with the people and share those experiences with my friends and my family. And that's living my best life. And, you know, always having some adventure to go on. Um, I think when you stop kind of get doing the things that you love to do, that's when you die. Right. Yep. So um, just keep doing the fun stuff that you really enjoy. And guess what? If you don't like it, don't do it. You can find <laughs> something else that you really like and go do that. Like I, I remember as a kid, I would buy books and I would read books. Like I read a lot of books and somebody said, so how's that book? I'm like, I don't really like it. They're like, well, why are you still reading it? And I'm like, because I bought the book, I have to finish <laughs> it. And they're like, but if you don't like the book, why are you wasting your time? Go get another book. <laughs> yeah. And then that really hit home to me. I'm like, so if you don't like hiking, don't hike. Yep. Go do something else. If, but if, you know, do the things you love with the people that you want to do it with. If you, you know, don't enjoy hiking with a particular group of people, don't go with them. Go with a different group of people. So that's kind of what I think about living your best life. No, it's great. And you can do it at any age, any age. Just get out there. Go do it. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. So to close out, what are three life lessons you've learned in life that you think would be of value to other people? Uh, It's okay to make mistakes, right? We learn from them. Totally fine. Make mistakes. Um, And to take a chance. And I know it's kind of like making mistakes is okay, but you know, Take a chance on people, take a chance on yourself, take a chance on activities because you never know um, what what you're going to fall in love with. And um, uh, I hate for people to regret, you know, like, oh, I wish I would have done that when I was younger. Well, if you wish you would have done that when you were younger, you can still do it now. Like that's for me too. Like, oh, I wish I would have done xyz i'm like well i still can do xyz so why don't i just go out and do it right um i sometimes money can be a factor for a lot of people so you just have to figure out well how can i save money for this activity versus something else so i guess those would be the things that i would consider no they're awesome so well thanks again it's uh been wonderful talking to you like it's been pretty inspirational for me i'm sure for a lot of other people and certainly very insightful especially on the backpacking and hiking sure a lot of people got a lot of value out of that so now uh, if anyone's interested in learning a little bit more about you and uh, connecting where can i find you online and also if they're interested in finding out a little bit more about the sierra clubs wilderness basics course um, how can i find out a little bit more information Yeah, so with regards to the Wilderness Basics course, we have a website, it's wildernessbasics.com. There are a few of these type programs uh, throughout the country. Um, In LA, it's called the Wilderness Travel Course. Um, The Wilderness Basics course isn't offered right across the whole country, just certain Sierra Club uh, sections. But if you are interested in, you know, going hiking with the Sierra Club, it's sierraclub.org. Um, And like I said, most of their hikes are always free and open to everyone in the public. Um, They may screen you to ensure that you have the right fitness level of knowledge because they don't want to take you to an area that where you might harm yourself. So they want to ensure that, you you know, that you're safe. Um, For myself, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter, all at Stephanie.Mayo. So that's S-T-E-F-A-N-I-E dot M-A-I-O. Um, and that's how most people can get in touch with me. Um, also if, you know, you get in touch with the wilderness basics course, I'm probably going to be the person that replies to you there too. (laughs) So, um, and we're on like, yeah, like I said, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we kind of try to be wherever people are. So cool. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Damien. I really appreciate spending this time with you. And I hope that we can inspire everyone to live their best life.